Passover. We're at the beginning of a great month as we seek to rediscover uh, the mission that God has given to us uniquely. If you're a guest, you come on a great day because we're talking about that. I want you to come every week, gang. Don't miss a Sunday. If you're off watching your favorite football team or whatever you're doing, by the way, a good reminder, don't base your worth or happiness on the ability for an 18-year-old to play football. Okay, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't have highs and lows because your team lost or didn't win or whatever they lost, you know, or even if they won, right? We're amazing. No, you're not amazing. They were amazing. Okay, but anyway, we pulled for teams. We're pulling for Jesus here on Sunday mornings. Be here every Sunday as we walk through in our connect groups. If you're in a connect group, you've already walked through um, a lesson this morning that really supplements, complements what we're trying to do. I was in my connect group this morning. Stacy has, has helped launch a group with some friends, incredible class, and I was able to be in there and teach a little bit. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, we have material here, but everybody needs to grab this, whether you're in a group or not, and it's online, because we're praying every single day for 30 days. We've already started, and I want every single person here, if you're a member of our church, if you're not, join us, but especially if you're a member, join us in prayer. If you're passionate about seeing God move mightily among us in these days, then you pray. The lack of desperation for prayer reveals something in us that we've got to change. A church that prays is one that sees the power of God move among them. So we're going to get to Matthew 28 because my hope today is to make the Great Commission great again. Okay, that's, that's, that's kind of my challenge for us uh, as a church because we're part of a different kingdom. Regardless of where the church gathers and meets in the world today, we are about joining Jesus on mission. You know, it was back in the 1930s that uh, the Nazi party, uh, the, 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 you know, Hitler's Germany, w- started a decades-long looting of uh, artwork throughout Europe. And in uh, 1941, they really began uh, th- this thing of, of, of in, you know, invading certain countries. They go into museums, and many great pieces were, all of them really, were essentially stolen. You might have seen Monuments Men. The movie was about that, essentially. George Clooney and Matt Damon. Um, We're in that film, but it was about this group that went then to rediscover and find again uh, masterpieces, works of art that were taken. Now, some of them were burned never to be seen again. Caravaggio, uh, Van Gogh's were stolen, taken, and destroyed. Now, some believe that artwork is still out there um, that hasn't been returned to its proper owner or place. Last month, Sylvie Sillitzter stood in the Jewish Heritage Museum in New York City beside a piece of art by Renoir. Some of you know that Auguste Pierre Renoir uh, was a great Impressionist artist. And she was the last remaining heir of her grandfather, who was a pre-war art collector, prominent art collector in Paris. And she was the only person they could find once they found this painting, this masterpiece. Renoir's works are, I mean, worth millions of dollars. So this this painting had been returned to its rightful owner, rediscovered what was lost, and it's now changed her life, right? She feels like some justice has been done, but she receives now this beautiful piece of art that's hers. Now, I'm told she's going to sell it. She's probably smart to do that, but she's (laughs) selling it, right? Um, and then paying off or, or giving and all. It's a really cool story. But the Nazi plunder that, that really destroyed and took away incredible works of art, uh, at least last month, was seen kind of a redemptive story. My point is this. Sometimes we need to rediscover the masterpiece and bring it back to its rightful place. And today we're going to start a month long of prayer And and petition before the Lord, messages and studies that are going to help us rediscover the mission that God's given us. Because mission, mission leaks. Mission, you can. It's true in your organization, your 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 family. It's true in your marriage. It's true in 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 your business. Mission can get off track, even one degree or two over time, and you're way off track. So sometimes, if we're not careful, we 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 need to to get back to the main mission that He's called us to. So that's what we're going to do today. The primary missionary, Jesus himself, came, and now he's called us to join him on mission with him. Now, there's a singular event that took place. We've been celebrating it today. Uh, It's the one event that took place in history 
And it's the reason we're here today. And you think about it, it's, it's the resurrection, right? It's the one thing that, that happened and everything else has changed. It's why we are here, right? It's why, there, I mean, there is no salvation. There's no hope in the world. There's no Christianity apart from the resurrection. You all know this, of a single event that took place. We have no Bible apart from the resurrection. Think about that. The reason we have the Bible as we know it is because a man named Matthew and a man named Mark, there was a guy named Luke and John, there was a man named Paul, and they simply wrote down what they saw and what they heard and, and, and what they knew had happened. And so what we see here, before we get to Matthew 28, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, For I delivered to you of first importance, as of first importance. He's saying, this is the first thing. There's only one first. This is priority. What I also received, that Christ died on or for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, he, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that would be Peter, then to the twelve, then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Paul knew these apostles, he named Cephas, who he knew well, He's naming people that are friends of his in his core group. And he's saying, these guys saw it. And in fact, Paul himself had an encounter with Christ that changed his life. So now this former terrorist, right, persecutor of the church, is writing. And he's saying, there's one thing, the single event that, that really kicked off all of it is the resurrection. And he said, don't miss this. Let's recalibrate everything back to Christ to what He's done and how He's taught us to live, and yes, to the resurrection. Apart from it, we have no hope. Apart from it, He's not Lord. He's not the one who can open the scroll. He doesn't have authority to be the one who determines who is saved, who's not saved, the one who allows us into heaven. See, the, the reason that the church exists is because of this singular event, right? And so all of our connect groups, all that we're doing this month, we're getting back to, we're recalibrating everything that we do back to Christ and His mission. In response, that's what I'm trying to say here, to the resurrection, to that singular event. All right, so my hope is that we rediscover the masterpiece that is the beauty, the church of Jesus Christ, and to talk about our church in particular, all right? So it's built on two things. Today we're going to talk about mission, of course. We're talking about mission and values and strategy and measures. Don't let that kind of talk throw you off. We're going to be central in Scripture as to what we're all about here. And today we're going to talk about two things. Our church is built on two things, really, the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. Some of you know that the Great Commandment is found in Matthew 22. It's where Jesus is responding to an attorney, essentially, to a Pharisee, who says, hey, what, what's the most important law of all? What's the greatest commandment of all of them? And he said that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? You're to love Him comprehensively. And then he says, this is the great and first commandment, but you can't go at that one without it being lived out in your life, that you're going to love others as you love yourself, he says here. We're going to learn that we're to love others as Christ loves us. Because, you see, we've not seen this kind of love before. And the word here for love is the word agape. It's a, watch this, nonsensical, unconditional, irrational kind of love. God tells us that if we love others that way, we forget, watch this, it's not just selfless love. It's enemy love. We see it most Perfectly expressed on the cross. Christ dying for His enemies. Us, if rightly understood. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us on the cross. This is enemy love. And so it's a radical kind of love. If we love others in the same way, so outrageous, people take notice. It's why Jesus said, if you love you know, those who love you, that's not a big deal. You, you know, I mean, the pagans do that. It's not this, again, law of reciprocity. It's a, it's, a, it's a grace that comes to those who don't deserve it. That's what changes the world when we love people as He has loved us. So we've gathered today to remember that kind of love, to celebrate it. That's why we gather every Sunday, because we want to love Him above all else. So Christ, the primary missionary, God, in the form of a man, comes to us, and then He calls us to join Him on His mission. 
rightly understood, the Great Commission there in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, is, is the call of the church. A biblically functioning church is a church that is seeking to accomplish the Great Commission. Now notice it's co-mission, right? It's the with mission. It's the with Jesus mission. Simply, watch this. Here's what we, we made church so complicated. Here's what we're doing. We're joining Jesus on the mission that he already started and he's given to us. And so in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you can see it there. He says this, Jesus came and said to them. Let's read this together, in fact. You got the ESV on the screen. Let's read it together. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now look at this. I want you to notice there's a singular. I know just enough Greek to be really dangerous. Watch this. Uh, So in the Greek, there's a singular verb, a primary verb. You watch for that. Um, And the primary verb, you might be looking at it and and take guesses, but you know what it is? It's to make disciples. That's the primary verb in this imperative command. But watch this. It's qualified. uh, It's described by three what we would call qualifying participles. You know, in English, participles are words that end with what? With I-N-G words, right? So here's what he says. How will we make disciples? Here's how. By going, by teaching, and by baptizing. That is the Great Commission. That's what the church is about. A church that's not making disciples is something other than a church. And this is why it's so kind of insidious. It's possible to look like a church, smell like a church, you know, be a church in a particular culture and not be the church. A church, how about this? When, and I talk about church. We often think, oh, yeah, the church, that the church, the church. No, you are the church. You and I make up the church, right? I mean, you know that it's not building it's people, but the people are me, you. So he's called you to be a disciple maker by going intentionally, by teaching others, all right, pouring your life into others, and by baptizing, by sharing the gospel. And then people are marked by baptism, enter into the fold of the church. The the, the ecclesia of the church, the called out ones. We're simply continuing on the work of Jesus. That's what we're doing. And here's what's cool. Look at what he says in John 14, 12. You can see it there. Truly, truly. Now, when he says that, he's going like, this is real talk. Okay, this is real. As if all he says is not true. All that he says is true. Truly, truly. Listen up. I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Because I'm going to the Father. This seems counterintuitive. In fact, the the disciples would challenge this. Going, Wait, wait. How is it that it's better that you leave? He says, it's better because when I leave, the Spirit's going to come. The Spirit's better than me right here in the flesh, right beside you. The Spirit's going to live in you, closer to you than your own breath, nearer to you than your own heartbeat. The Spirit of God lives in you. Those of us who've been transformed, who've received His grace, and so we can do the works He's called us to do. This is what's really crazy in our day. I'm seeing a new Christian version, a Christian version of anger and anxiety in our culture today. When we're to be the people with the non-anxious presence. And our anxiety and our anger and outrage, this Christian version of outrage, simply reveals our idols. Idols of nationalism. Idols of racism. Idols of of privilege. Idols of, gosh, you name it. Uh, It's just on and on. and, And it's embarrassing, frankly. We're the people who are winning. We have Christ, our Lord, who's running this whole thing. And he's called us to be difference makers, to be disciples, light and salt in the world. And check it out. The darker it gets, the greater the light shines. And the, and the more our, our culture shifts from, from being a, a kind of a, what call, some are calling that a postmodern culture. I mean, post-Christian even. All right. We're haunted by Christian virtues and values is what many would say now. But it's kingdom. It's seeking a kingdom without the king. It's, it's seeking Christianity or seeking to be Christian without Christ, without pursuing Him daily, without being filled with His Spirit, without even being saved, many people would claim to be Christian. 
We've talked about in our, our connect groups today a bit. But, but here's what I want us to do. I want to I think for a moment with you about, about our church. Now, I, I think about this all the time. So y'all, y'all get in here close and, and think with me. If you're a guest, just kind of listen in, family talk. Our church has got to continue to do everything we can to align all that we do to the mission of God in the world. And the tension that we always have is between mission, okay, what I say is core, and then method. Methods simply accomplish the mission. Methods are always changing, right? We're not, uh, they change for a couple of reasons. One, we're trying to pass the gospel on to the next generation. And every generation, I think, is at a different place, right? And will receive the message that doesn't change in a different form or different way, different methods, right? Methods constantly change. Message never change. The, the, me- the methods also change uh, d- regarding a context where you may find yourself. Why is it that a church like ours right here would be different from a church, say, in South Dallas context? Why would a church like ours right here be different from, say, Northwest Bible Church, where my friend Neil Tomba is the pastor? Why would that church right across the street be different from us? Well, there's three things, essentially, that, that, would, that would cause a certain expression. That's it. Watch this. The Great Commission, yes, expressed in a unique way among a certain body of people. One is local context is always real important. Our local context is even different from, say, South Dallas or somewhere in another part of our city. Certainly different than India or Africa or Guatemala or Cambodia or these places where we find ourselves in the Caribbean serving him. The church looks very different. People are singing songs today with instruments we've never heard in our lives in Africa and places like that because of context, right? So context is one that, that determines the mission of the church, or the methods, I should say. And also, then, a, a church, what happens is a collective group of people are brought together by God's design. You are here in this church, not another, because God's brought you here. So the collective potential of the gifts and the people gathered determines how that mission is expressed, right? Right? And then the collective, or I should say the passion of the leaders that God has called, primarily the shepherd or shepherds, the leaders of the church, and the passion that he's given them. And so all those things together form this local context within which the expression of the Great Commission is offered from a particular group of people. And he's called all of us to be a part of that. So here, our great challenge, you've heard it talked about if you've been around here much, our great challenge is not atheism. That would be the case if we were off in Soviet Russia or other places, China. Atheism would be a challenge. It's not radical Islam, which would be the case if we were in Jakarta, Indonesia, or somewhere off in another part of the world, maybe in the Middle East. That's not our challenge. It's not Hinduism. It's not Buddhism. It's not, it's not a, a, an Eastern ideology. Our great challenge, if you ask anybody in North Dallas, hey, tell us, if you were kind of self-described your spiritual stance or religion, what would it be? Most people, not all, most people would say, I'm a Christian. And we know that that means a lot of things these days, right? For a lot of people, it seems to mean a particular, um, gosh, maybe an ideology of morality, a moral vision of how people ought to live, a good citizen, um, American, a Christian. Uh, it might be a, so a lot of people believe it's a political voting block is what Christian is. Some people believe that. It's, um, you know, it could be any one of those things. It's a social construct. It's a group of people. Some people think it's a bunch of white people. That's Christian. You know, some people really believe that. And so instead, the word has kind of lost its meaning. It, it, instead, it's, it, it's, 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 it's this passion that God's given us to challenge cultural Christianity in our context, that we rescue each other. We rescue the, the world around us, people around us from cultural Christianity. So we say it this way. We exist to make disciples to the glory of God. We can pause there. But in our context, it's to rescue one another from cultural Christianity, to follow Jesus every single day. And so we, we've talked already this morning. I hope you'll get in a connect group. Find one. Help us get you in one in the weeks to come because we're unpacking a lot of this in our groups We've talked about cultural Christianity. Now, I just want to challenge you before we go. It, it's this. It's a juxtaposition of religion versus relationship. It, again, it, it's, it's Christianity without Christ. Are you pursuing Him every single day in your life? I want you to be real honest here. 
Are you truly, watch this, your prayer life will determine whether you truly are pursuing a passionate relationship with Him. Are you praying daily? Are you in His Word? If you're not, I could challenge you. You just might be a cultural Christian. Is the time that you focus primarily on the Lord and His Word and you seek to really get hyped about Christian things when you're, only when you're in the church? And then the rest of the week, not so much. You're distracted by the culture. You see, you just might be a cultural Christian. It's law versus grace. It's dependent upon Christian morality. A new Phariseeism. It's law versus grace. It's doing versus being. That is to say that sin is a condition of the heart. You can't rescue yourself. You need Christ. Again, we've talked about it. It's consumerism versus discipleship. I just come to church, consumer, having my needs fulfilled, spiritual goods and services somehow. It's weekly versus a daily walk with Christ. I've said it this way. You know, it's great that we come together and worship. I tell you that circles are better than rows. In other words, as we get into groups of life on life, might be around a meal, accountable in relationships as disciples pouring into each other's lives. Circles are better than rows, but watch this. Disciples are better than circles. Disciples living out their lives every single day for Him. That's what He's called us to be, what He's called us to do. So Sylvie Siddiker was her name. She received the great gift from her great-grandfather. She had no idea. This masterpiece was presented to her. And she's able to see this great treasure. We are called to pass the gospel on to the next generation. The beautiful masterpiece that is the gospel and the church. The expression of this new vision of the world that God's given us. So many people who aren't a part of the body of Christ. This week, I want to challenge you to go. Go and make disciples. And we do it all in response to what He's done for us. Look at Colossians 1, 13 and 14. You can see it there. For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's to pray together as we close our time. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We praise you for the beauty that is the church. You are worthy of our praise, worthy of our worship, not just here in a song, but as we live our lives this week for you. May we be disciples who pursue you daily, and make disciples, letting our light shine in our places of influence. May it start in our marriages, our families, our friends, roommates, our schools, our work. May we be the light you've called us to be. And Lord, I pray now for those who are here who've never received your grace. They think just going to church, maybe. Maybe they've been to church. Thinks They think that, that makes them a Christian. Lord, may they come to know you now. Receive your grace. Friend, just pray. Say, God, rescue me from my sin. Jesus, thank you for that single event. It has changed everything. Change my life now. I receive your grace. Forgive me of my sin. And I want to respond by living all the days of my life for you. Into eternity. Friend, maybe you're here today and you need to join the fellowship of the church. Don't leave without doing so. Maybe you need to pray with someone. Maybe you need someone to answer some questions. Don't leave without doing so. We're here for you today. So Lord, we give you our lives. We praise you for the opportunity we have in this country to come together and worship you. Now we scatter around the world, across the city, to be witnesses for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.